as we've been studying Romans, it's led up to this moment. Think about it. This is chapter 16 of Romans. We've read about the great God who gave us the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For in it is the power of God and salvation for all who believe to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And that led us through everything. You think of the Romans road. Think of the Romans road. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. People use that all the time. In fact, if all you had was the book of Romans and a gospel, you could literally go out and save the world. In Jesus' name. So when you think about Romans, you think about the very foundation of the gospel, the very foundation of the word of God. And we have justification in Christ by faith alone, in Christ alone, by the word of God alone. You think about the great doctrines that we've studied. Now Paul is going to lead us to Romans 16. He's going to lead us to the conclusion And again, he has already asked them to fund him, to have fellowship with him, to have him go on his way to Spain with their blessings, with them engaged and included within the gospel, with the mission of the gospel, and that they're going to be a part of it. So that means their prayer and their financial support, when he goes out and plants churches, when that great day before the throne of Jesus Christ, the Bema Seat, they will receive the same rewards that Paul does based upon their proportion of their support with his ministry, as if they were with him side by side. Yet they're not there physically, but they're there spiritually. So it makes you think about this. And then now we're going to be introduced to a bigger team that Paul has. Have you ever re- uh, read something or, or you've written something where it says, hey, say hi to aunt so-and-so? You know, say hi, to, because you miss them, but you know them, right? Well, that's what this is. Greet so-and-so. Every time you see that, say hi to so-and-so. So we're going to start with Romans 16, and we're going to go through the whole chapter. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria. Now, servant, just going to stop real quick. That is the same word we derive for deacon, deaconess. It's the female version in this case, or it could be the male version. I, I have to do a little research on that, but it's the same word that's used for deacon. And continue reading in verse 2. It says that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints or worthy of a holy one. Every time you see the saints, don't think of Roman Catholic saints that have been sainted. Okay, Think of holy ones, holy, devoted, really on fire for Jesus people. Okay, Those who are truly born again, that kind of thing. They're, they're engaged in Christ. And assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many people and of myself also. So this woman, Phoebe, is someone who is already there or is coming and wants that Roman church to receive her as if it was almost Paul himself. This was a great helper, and she helped with leading leading or partially leading or assisting in leading the church in Sancria or Centria, So when you look at this, you go, well, wait a minute. Women can be involved in helping churches being planted and growing in missionary outreach. Yes, they can, of course. We're not talking about a senior pastoral elder because that would be interesting for a woman to be married to a woman because it says elders should be married to a woman. So that kind of leaves that out, elder uh, class. Um, unless they're involved in sin. Now, today, I guess there are some churches that are okay with that, a woman marrying a woman. But in this case, God's way of thinking is that elder should be a man who can marry a woman. Okay, it's gender. The actual gender is in the Greek, a man. 
So it isn't just anthropos, it's andros. So it is male. So in this case, Phoebe was able to do almost anything in leadership short of being an elder. That's amazing. Now think of the other religions. There were a few other religions at that time that allowed that, but they were very immoral. If you think about the women priestesses of some of the pagan uh, cults. So short of that, this was amazing. So let's continue on. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. And of course, you know them if you've read the, the book of Acts. Well, why is he bringing up Phoebe and Priscilla and Aquila right at the first? Because these are the biggest helpers in his ministry. These are folks that they know of. These are folks that, that Rome, the Church of Rome, knows. And in fact, Priscilla and Aquila have been there. They were there to begin with, and then they were persecuted out for a while joined Paul in his ministry, and then have come back to the Church of Rome. So that was kind of their home base. So, hey, say hi to Priscilla and Quilla, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So in the region where Paul did his main ministry, they were great help while they were with Paul. They helped a lot. And we saw a highlight of how they helped out Apollos in Ephesus. So we see these guys did everything. They risked their own necks. They labored hard in the Lord, and they helped greatly with a lot of churches. They had an impact. So he's highlighting people who the Church of Rome knows. Now, again, remember, Rome has never saw or seen Paul's face yet. They haven't really seen him face to face. But they each know a lot of people in common. Now, I want you to see there's a lesson here about this. Collaboration, friendships, relationships. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So they're actually meeting in homes. See, they're meeting publicly and from house to house. We see that pattern everywhere. So not only are they helpers, but they're also leading like what we would call a life group, where the church, that is the body of Christ, is meeting in their home. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Remember Corinth, Achaia, that area. And so you've got some of the first people who've come to know Jesus there. And evidently, he's not just somebody who came to know Jesus and isolated himself, but was also involved in ministry. Greet Mary, who labored much. Now, listen to these words, labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen, that is, fellow Jews. It's interesting, though, they have Andronicus and Junia. Those are Greek or Greco-Roman kinds of names, and yet they were Jews, my countrymen. Some people think that it might be my countrymen, meaning Tarsus, where he came from. So it could be both or one or the other. And my fellow prisoners, so they spent some time in prison with him for the gospel's sake who are of note among the apostles. What? Wait a minute. Not the 12 apostles? What? Apostles? That means missionaries. Those who were sent out by the churches to plant other churches, to spread the gospel. Who are also who are also in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Our fellow worker. That means Rome and Paul shared this guy our fellow worker, and Stakey's my beloved. Makes you hungry when you think Stakey's, doesn't it? Steak and shake, Stakey's. Uh, greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. I guess the rest of them are not narcissistic, <laughs> except for the ones that are in the Lord. See, you notice how he differentiates there. See, while you're going through Scripture, pay attention to words. Pay attention to these things. A lot of times there's keys to unlock these these passages. And and think of this as also, I'm writing back home or I'm writing to some friends to say hi about these people. There's relationship involved. This is personal closeness that he has with these people. And notice these are all workers. These are people who've 
who've done something in Christ, who, who aren't just sitting back. They're involved in the gospel. Greek Tryphena and Tryphosa. I wonder if they were twins, you know, just to differentiate them, put a different name tag on them. Who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Now, these are words that means strenuous labor. They worked very, very hard in the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Sharing the gospel. It means sharing the gospel, making disciples, doing the necessary kinds of things for missionary work. Greet Rufus, and we meet him also in uh, 1 uh, Timothy at the end, where Paul is talking about Rufus or Pudens, who married the daughter of the king who was captured by Rome, the British king, who was captured and came to Christ, married her, and there were a lot of things talked about them, poems about this great wedding that happened in Rome. So it's it was a well-known thing. So Rufus would also be called Rufus Pudens. But notice what Paul says, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. So his family... Paul's family and Rufus Pudens' family. And it turns out he was like a general in the Roman army and eventually became a senator. So he knows people in high places. And Christ was bringing people to the Lord in high places. Pretty amazing. Um, if you continue on here, it says, Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philogolus, Julia, Nerus, and her sister, Olympus, and all the saints who were with them. So these are people who are well known to Rome, who are there in the Roman church family, and who Paul knows and have somehow worked with, or knows somebody who knows somebody. Somehow they know each other. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Okay. So greet one another with a holy kiss. I have a link on your paperwork if you want to do further, deeper study on that. Uh, there are some church movements that go into saying that you need to do this. Now, if you look in Europe and you see them kiss each other on the cheek when they see each other, Middle East, they do that. There's a lot of areas in the world that they do that. It's derived from this, but what it means is this was already a common practice of a welcome kiss, what they would call a platonic welcome kiss. It's like how we do culturally a handshake or kind of a hug. It's the same exact cultural meaning of a practice. So what he's saying here is do it in a holy way. Do what is already going on. You're greeting with one another in a holy way. And if you want to study a little more, there's an online video about it by a good teacher who really goes in depth about it. And uh, make sure you drink a lot of coffee. That was a hint there. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the what? To the doctrine. Not our traditions, not our practices, according, but contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Okay, what doctrine have you learned? Basically, what Paul just presented. So, the Bible. And avoid them. That avoid is not just, I'm avoiding them. It means push them out. Avoid them. Reject them. Make sure they don't be a part of your fellowship once you figure this out. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Now he's going to shift here. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. So like babes, be children when it comes to evil. Be very innocent. But I want you to be wise. Really know the good. Know it as part of everything that you do and do it. Verse 20, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So this is where the first part of the 
hey, say hi to everybody. And everybody over here in this area said hi to you real quick. Okay. He's wanting to do that, give some warning and encouragement. We're going to go over this a little more. And then he starts talking about, hey, everybody here individually, there's some people that want to say hi. Shout out a hi to you. Timothy, my fellow worker, Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. This is a great way to find out where he's writing from because Sosipater is in Corinth. So now we know he's written this, he's hanging out in Corinth until he goes to his next kind of mission. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. So I wrote a little bit about that on your sheet there and explaining he, and he hired somebody like a secretary to be able to write for him. So Tertius, the actual guy who's writing this, shouts out a hi, hello. We know that Luke wrote Luke and the book of Acts commissioned from Paul because Luke was a part of Paul's team. So in a sense, Luke was like that to Paul as well. So we know that's common practice. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. So these are highfalutin folks, politicians. He knew people in politics. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He says that again. The grace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you, that is establish, strengthen, root you, get you to the point of where your roots are deep and you are flourishing, fruitful, strong, and multiplying. That's all kind of bundled up in that establish. You're stable enough to grow. Uh, it's like a ship on the sea and it's stable now. It's all these pictures are in here. To establish you according to, what's it according to? My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So the gospel is front and center of establishing a church. The gospel, not just not just hearing the gospel, but preaching it, shouting it, sharing it, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. That is, everything that is a church is based upon the word of God and actively preaching the word of God. According to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. He ends it with encouragement and a bolstering of energy to be triumphant. Similar to the songs, the theme of the songs we sang today. He ends it with a high note of triumph, of victory, rooted in obedience to the very God of creation. So now let's go through and parse this a little. So Paul wanted to continue a relationship started with other churches and with the church of Rome. You see, he had relation, every church that he planted or every church that was planted, but somehow he was involved in growing. When he touched them, he wanted to link all these churches together in some fashion. He had workers involved that came with him. Remember we talked about last week where the churches in Lystra and Derby, we're not sure which one because it says Lystra and Derby. And so it's kind of like Minneapolis, St. Paul, Dallas, Fort Worth. It's kind of an area where you have these two cities and there is a church or church is smack in the middle, and they sent Timothy to go with Paul. Paul really worked with them and said, hey, i really like Timothy to go with me. And they were okay with that, and they sent. So you have churches collaborating with workers who would occasionally go with Paul, or sometimes they would already go and stay with him, like almost forever, like Timothy or Titus. And so we see this kind of relationship. But also, there were some workers that he had and worked with that the Church of Rome worked with and collaborated, such as Priscilla and Aquila. And you saw that list that he said, greet them, that is, say hi to them, because they're already there in Rome. These are fellow workers. Some of them are fellow countrymen, that is, Jews, fellow countrymen maybe from Tarsus area. And so you've got this collaboration of relationship. Everything he did 
was not based upon a business model, but based upon personal relationships founded upon the doctrinal purity of the Word of God. Let me say that again. It was not based upon a business model, professional kind of model. It was based upon personal relationships, based upon the Word of God, doctrinal purity of the Word of God. So he used that family model. Missionary teams, everything was say, say hi to them. You, you know, in a family kind of situation, a lot of times this time of year, people write letters to each other. And there's a tradition that started about the 1800s. That they, they've done this. And it's kind of a shout out of a hi. Say hi to aunt so-and-so and grandma so-and-so. And, you know, can't wait to see you someday or, or maybe we'll see you. You know, all of those kind of things. That's the fragrance that you sense here from this letter, uh, this closing of this letter to, to Rome. What he's trying to say is, not only do I want to be helped in a missionary way and be sent, but hey guys, I know some of the folks you know. We know each other. We're all kind of in this together. We're, we're about the mission together. So other Christians whom he's worked with, you see, that's a different thing. Who he is work, who has worked with, he's worked with them, has relationship with them. They aren't strangers to him. He's not saying say hi to somebody he doesn't know. That's a key. In ministry and relationships, it's good to get to know folks, spend time with folks, hang out with them, not just know their resume. And that is a danger sometimes with churches hiring pastors. They don't know this person. But churches flourish better when they have other people like in exchange, like Rome did, with people that they, they know that Paul knows. Or Paul could work with these people because they've been working with the Church of Rome. They have credibility based upon trusted relationships. That's very key in, in missionary work or any kind of ministry. So it might take some time. If there are some strangers coming together and God is pulling them together, it's really good to spend time to get to know each other. Really good. And that's what he's talking about here. Relationships are the key in ministry. Yes, the Word of God, the Great Commission, yes. But that is well oiled by relationships. Relationships are a key. Then he goes on and starts warning the churches. Now, this is very important. He says, now I urge you, brethren, to note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. That is, when you think about when, when people have a job or employment, the basic necessities is really all they're working for. Food clothing, and shelter. And they might need transportation, a vehicle, to help with that, but that's not an essential because we have legs. Unless a person doesn't have legs, then you might have to help them. So, so you see kind of everything relates to feeding your belly. Well, if you're in Christ, your goal isn't feeding your belly. Your goal is serving Jesus and pleasing him. Well, these folks come in and they look like they're Christians, but they will use smooth words and flattering speech and deceive the hearts of simple. That means they are very persuasive, charismatic. Remember the itching ears? They, those are the folks who really like them. And they sound good, but really they aren't that good. Look at what it says in Titus, what Paul says to Titus. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning, knowing that such a person is perverted and sins being self-condemned. So reject, that means push out. You're not allowed here. A lot of folks like that person because they're the life of the party or they have family relationships or whatever, just fill in the blank. We cannot allow that to happen. And so when a, when a uh, church is growing, you're going to see uh, Satan send those kind of people. They'll be divisive, and they will cause 
consternation, and it's divisive about doctrine. He says so. Doctrine. Contrary to the doctrine you've learned. It's, in essence, a doctrinal issue. Here's Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. This is Paul warning the Ephesians elders. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or elders, to shepherd. Now, notice the shepherding or pastoral ministry of the elders. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That shows the deity of Christ, who died upon the cross, Jesus. It says, God purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, be diligent, watch. This is military, like a watch, you know, on the on the fortress with your with your gun drawn or your arrow drawn and you're looking, watch, be sober. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He was strenuously warning them. They may not have really caught how important, critically important it was that doctrine stay pure, doctrinal purity. And so Satan will send folks in that have a good game, have a good talk, or smooth talkers, and will seek to lead away people with deceptive talk that sounds so good. They're slick. You know, it's funny that Paul the Apostle, he writes heavy letters, it says, but in person he's pretty timid, it says. He isn't a good speaker. He puts himself down. Uh, other people are saying, well, he's probably not that good of a speaker. But he teaches correctly. Do you, see, do you see the difference? God chooses sometimes folks who aren't that charismatic, who aren't like that sometimes, because so that only God gets the glory. And so you don't look at the person. You look at what he's talking about, so it directs you to him, to God. You don't have your eyes on that person or those persons who are teaching. You have your eyes on Jesus. It's very deceptive. But there are folks who follow these great teachers and then they go astray into some weird doctrine. And there are people who follow them along. And then they go off into some weird immorality. You almost have Jonestown to show you kind of a little bit about that. So it's very, very critical that we pay attention to that. And then he doesn't want to leave them there. That would be a sorrow note. Wouldn't it be a sorrow sour note to leave them on so he wants to leave them with encouragement and he wants to bolster their faith he wants to lead them leave them with thinking of triumphant glory of christ and how they are following the warrior god who will go before them in triumph for your obedience has become known to all therefore i am glad on your behalf but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Crush Satan. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all or be with you. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all the nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Those are encouraging words. Those are bolstering my faith kind of words. Those are the kind of words of directing me to a conquering God who will crush Satan under my feet. This is a conquering God who is the everlasting God. This is the God who gave commandments to whom we are to obey. This is a God who should be honored, a conquering warrior God. And that's what he's conveying, that we're a part. We are followers of this God. That means that we are warriors as well. We are triumphant because he is triumphant. That's what he's trying to convey. He's showing overall 
that your calling is not isolated. You are a part of a bigger world of Christianity. You're a part of other churches, other Christians. Your relationship to Christ, your mission, your calling, all leads us to victory. That is, all of this leads us to victory in Christ. Not just by myself, but because I'm a part of it all. He will establish, strengthen, stand firm. We will be resolute. How does this apply to us? Notice he ends it with obedience. He ends that chapter with obedience. Our key to victory is obedience. Obedience to the faith. Not obedience to something blind or traditions. But the body of faith, meaning that which we hold to and believe, kind of like a statement of faith, what we are to obey, the Bible, what we are to obey, that which relates to us in Christ. Remember, we've talked about this. All the promises in Christ are yes and amen in him to the glory of God through us. So we know that there are specific promises that only apply to those who are new covenant followers of Christ. Not all the promises in the Bible apply to us, but those that relate to us in Christ do. In the same way, that which relates to us for us to obey. There are tons of commands in Scripture, but there's a set of commands that relate to us that we are to obey in Christ. And that's what we are to obey. And so that's what he's focusing on, to obey according to the faith our Christian faith, according to the new covenant faith in Christ, then we will be victorious. See, the obedience connection to faith is where we have victory in Christ. So that is what he wants us to have, to leave us with this. Triumphant courage to spread the gospel and to make disciples in Christ. He leaves the Roman church with victory in their hands. But it's their choice. And I want to talk about choice real quick. God is the only one who has free will. Let me get technical. Because he created the universe according to his will. Everything exists based upon his will. Humans, we have volition. We have a will. But we don't have free will in the sense God has. We have freedom of choice in the context we are in. So Adam and Eve had freedom of choice in the context they were in. They didn't have the choice to say, I'm going to be an animal. I'm going to be a tree. Or I'm going to jump from here and go over to New York City, which didn't exist. But, you know, that would be free will. Freedom of choice within context means freedom of choice within the context of the choices God allows me to have. Okay? So... In the sense of now that we know the will of God, in the sense of we know the Bible or we're learning the Bible, that opens up the choices for us of to obey God or not. In this case, what is he encouraging them to do? He's encouraging them to obey God according to what's been revealed to them in the Christian faith, and then they will have this victory. Then they will have success. Go through the Proverbs and you'll see this over and over again. The lazy person wants and craves certain things, but the diligent is successful. So being diligently obedient to Christ always brings success in God's eyes. Isn't that amazing? So all of those principles and precepts and patterns we see in Scripture all relate to and is consistent with what Paul is saying. Paul is saying the same thing. And when you go through the Bible, you'll see it over and over and over again. Go through Ecclesiastes. It's very depressing. But when you get to the end, when you get to the end, because it just shows you how humankind is left to their own devices. But when you get to the end, it says, well, this is what you need to do. Trust God. Obey God while you still have the chance. (laughs) While you still can. And so the same thing for us today. Obey him according to the gospel. Obey him and we will make disciples. Amen? God will open up doors for us to to be more successful in Christ as we obey him, as we surrender to him, as we fall in love with him. God will 
do whatever he wants to do in us and through us if we're available. Amen? Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we get up and, and let's sing this last song. Remember, we follow a warrior God who is triumphant. Amen?